hope is for you to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. After the service, begin that process by connecting with a leader and joining one of our many small groups or teams. But for now, sit back and enjoy this message from our good friend in England, Charlotte Gamble. What is up, Substance? Make some noise wherever you are at. You made it to church. My name is Pastor Carolyn Haas, and I'm so glad to see all of you. Could you give a warm welcome to those joining us online? And those of us, we've got people joining us from campuses and locations all over the world, so we love you. We're glad you're in church today. We have such a special treat. We are actually gonna hear from one of my favorite, favorite preachers. Her name is Charlotte Gamble. She's from England, her and her husband pastor there. And I heard her preach this message a few weeks ago. And I was like, Peter, we have to share this message at Substance. So we did some back channel communication. We got formal permission. And I am telling you, church, this is a word. So I'm asking you, lean in. Get your phone out to take notes, or if you're old school, write it in a notebook, but God is gonna speak to you. So would you give a warm substance welcome to Charlotte Gamble. I'm ready to preach the word to you today. I wanna talk to you really about a subject that I think we all can identify with, some maybe more than others this morning. You'll find this resonates, but I wanna talk about a season, an aspect of our life that we need to know how to navigate. And that's the area, the season that I'm calling unfair, unfair. Have you ever said over this past few weeks, months, you know, it's just unfair. Is it just me that has said that? Well, it's unfair I can't do vacation. It's unfair that the plans for the birthday got canceled. It's unfair that I can't hug on all the people I wanna hug on. It's unfair that I couldn't get to church services. It's unfair I'm in a service with a mask on my face. Have you ever said in this season, it's just unfair? I think we all have used that term. And for others, it's a lot more serious because in this season, some have thrived. For example, if you have a business that makes hand sanitizers, this has been a good season for you, right? You're doing well right now. But for many others, this season that they didn't ask for, we didn't see it coming. It's been unfair. It has meant that businesses have struggled. It's meant financially people have found themselves in a place they didn't expect to be. It's meant relationally our world has shifted and changed. And is the best way I can describe it is it's just unfair. You didn't ask for it, you didn't want it, you didn't see it coming. We're just now having to navigate it, right? And if you're a parent in here and you raised your kids, you will know that there's times in your household where your kids will tell you, it's not fair, right? And every parent in here will have said these words back to your children, life's not fair. We've all said it. Life's not fair, so get used to it, buddy. Life's not fair. And it seems a strange thing to talk about, but I think we need to talk about it in the church. We actually need to talk about the fact that life isn't fair. Not everybody gets the same start in life. Not everybody gets the same kind of deal in life. Some people have to deal with terrible illnesses. Other people don't. Some deal with terrible loss. Other people don't. We all have different things we have to navigate. And you know, God told us that in this life, we were gonna have trouble. Never seen that promise on a fridge magnet, not once. But it's still a promise. It's just not a very popular one. But you know, he tried to let us know there's gonna be times, there's gonna be seasons when you're gonna have to deal with things that actually just are unfair. And you're gonna have to find in that place of unfair a language, a vocabulary, a tenacity, a faith that gets you through that season. And right now we are surrounded by people as Pastor Chris reminded us last week, people that desperately need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, people that need hope in their hopelessness. And if we as the church don't know how to navigate unfair, how can we help the world? And so I want us to consider that in the Word this morning because there's something else. The good news today is there's something else that is also unfair. 
And the unfair favour of God is the hope that we have in the midst of our hopelessness. The unfair grace and kindness and goodness and mercy that followed you when you got out of bed this morning, even though you didn't ask for it or deserve it, it follows you, the Bible says. Why? Because God in His kindness and in His justice and in His mercy is so over the top generous towards us and it's unfair because we couldn't earn it, we don't deserve it and we have to remind ourselves of that when we're in these seasons that we have to navigate in life. I read the Bible and so many of those that we would say were heroes in the faith to us, they had to navigate unfair. It's not fair that Moses was born in a time when all baby boys were supposed to be murdered. It's not fair they had to be put in a basket and sent away from his family. But how many of you know the favour of God navigated where that basket needed to be? It's not fair that Jabez's mother named him that name. Jabez, his name meant pain. Imagine that with your siblings. Your mother calls you, hey, Steve, come down for dinner. Heidi, come down for dinner. Pain, get out of your bedroom and come for dinner. That's not kind. That's not fair that out of all of the siblings, you're called pain. But I love what Jabez did. What did he do? He went to God and said, look, my name's not fair. So could you do me a favor, God? And could you enlarge my territory? And could you change my name? And God says, yes, I can. So I don't know where this finds you today. Maybe you have had something happen to you that wasn't your fault. Something happened relationally or circumstantially and you're like, it just is unfair. Well, I wanna teach you how to live and how to move forward from that place. And that place I am calling today Low Debar. Everybody say Low Debar. It's just a cool thing to say, Lo Debar. Sounds cool, but it was not a cool place. It's an actual place that existed, a place where people lived. It was a town, a place where people did life. But Lo Debar was not an attractive place on Zillow to search for a house. Lo Debar was not up there with where you would want to be moving into the neighborhood. The name Lo Debar explains exactly what the place was like. Lodabar means this, a place of no pasture, a place of no words, and a place of no thing. Lodabar was a place where people didn't sense they had a place to lay their head, a place where they felt a sense of security, no rest, no peace, no pasture, a place where they didn't feel that they had a voice, where their voice had been removed from them. That was one of the meanings of Lodabar, a place where actually there was a disconnection and a dispossession from the things that maybe they once had. So now they feel in Lodabar, it is a place of no thing. Maybe that's a place that you can identify with. Maybe you entered this year with great hope and great expectation and now you find yourself in a place where you feel there's no pasture. The things that I planned for, they're not happening. The job that I expected to get, I never got. The promotion never came. My business never took off in the way that I thought and you feel like you're living in low Debar. Well, I wanna talk about someone that did live in low Debar. His story is recorded in the book of 2 Samuel and his name is Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth lived literally in Lob Debar, but that was not where he began his story. Oh, his story had such great potential. His story was a life that should have looked so different. And we find about his story and how it turned literally overnight in 2 Samuel 4. Maybe you feel something happened to you and your world literally overnight changed. That is Mephibosheth's story. But if there's hope today for Mephibosheth, there is hope today for you. And God did something in this man's life that God will also do in your life. And that's what I want us to learn from today. But let me show you how his world literally was flipped upside down within just a few hours. It says in 2 Samuel 4 that Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son. So his father, Mephibosheth's father, was Jonathan. And therefore, his grandfather was Saul. Now, when he was age five, 
news came to him about Saul and Jonathan from Jezreel. The news that came to him at age five was that his father and his grandfather had both been killed in battle. So suddenly this young boy who doesn't understand what's going on has the most unfair hand dealt to him in life where he's left fatherless, he's left without his dad, without his granddad. Overnight that orphanness is, enters his world. He didn't ask for it. He didn't deserve that to happen to him. It was not anything he could prepare for. But then after that, something else happens because now he can't stay in his home because people are coming to try and take over the palace. And so now he has to run for his life. So the one that was supposed to be in charge and looking after him, she picks him up as a young boy. And it says she begins to run with him to flee the house. And as she runs with him and hurries to leave, she drops the boy and he fell. And in his fall, he became disabled. His name was Mephibosheth. Talk about life dealing you an unfair set of circumstances. This young man went from a prince to a fugitive. He went from able-bodied to disabled. He went from living in a palace to actually moving to where he ended up next, which was Lo Debar. His whole world changed overnight. And maybe you can relate to that scenario, the news you didn't expect, the revelation you didn't know, the betrayal you didn't perceive, the loss that suddenly came out of the blue. All of us face those things that can send us to Lodabar. So if you are at Lodabar, or if you know someone who is right now living in Lodabar, let me help you with some things that you need to know. Number one is this. Your status, the status that life gives you, does not alter the significance within you. Let me say that again. The status that life gives you does not alter the significance within you. Listen, Mephibosheth lost his title, but he did not lose his value. He did not lose his value. You need to hear this loud and clear today. Because in the shaking of the season that we have been in, or in the shaking of circumstances that may happen in your life, you often realize that you have put your identity in the wrong places. You've allowed your status to be attached to the thing that you draw your significance from. So being the head of the business makes you feel important. Being the pastor of the church makes you feel important. Being the leader in this area makes you feel important. And sometimes when those things are stripped from us, we realize, wow, I've been building on this instead of building on the one who all of this belongs to. Your status that life gives you, the label that people give you does not alter the significance and the value within you. You might be an ex-addict, but that is not who God calls you. You might be a single parent, but that's not the label He gives you. You might be unmarried and wish you were married, but that's not how God categorizes you. You might have failed in an area, but God doesn't call you by the label that other people choose for you. Your significance does not change because the value inside of you never depreciated. And in Lodabar, a lot of us have to figure this out. In Lodabar, many of us have to realize, wow, I put so much importance on something that actually God doesn't place an importance on. Listen, if status was the finishing, defining significance of people in the Bible, the stories would read very, very differently. What about Gideon? He said, well, my status is I'm weakest of the weakest of the weakest of the weak. There was a lot of weeks. Maybe you feel in this season, man, I used to feel powerful. I used to feel influential. I used to feel important. But because of what I've gone through, I feel weak. And then I feel even weaker than weak. Maybe that's how you're feeling right now. But don't let that become the label that you live under because God's favor did not see weakest of weak. God's favor said, hello, mighty warrior. <laughs> Gideon's like, who are you talking to? He's like, you. I know you're letting all these things around you tell you who you are, but last time I checked, I created you and I know who you are, mighty warrior. God began to call him. 
in a way that Lodabar didn't. What about Mary? Her status would have been unwed teenage girl. That's not a good status to have in the time where she lived and in the neighborhood where she was from. But what they saw with their human eyes, they failed to see heaven's perspective, which was chosen carrier of a savior. How wrongly labeled she was by people around her when God had actually called and chosen her. I could go on. They even labeled Jesus carpenter's son. So sometimes we have to realize we've been trained by low debar thinking to allow status to become so important and all the time devaluing the significance that is already inside us. Your job does not tell you if you're significant or not. So if you lose your job, you need to tell yourself in the morning, in the mirror, I still have value. I still have worth. This chapter will change. There is a future ahead for me. There are good things on the horizon for me. Don't allow the world's way of labeling to become the way that you view and see yourself. I love what God does because when we end up in Lodabar, when we end up in this place of feeling we don't have significance, God begins to rewrite our story. And it's always in God's perfect timing. And so what God does is God drops on David's mind this question. And so we read that David begins to ask this question. The timing of it is all God. The awareness in David is all God. And if God can do this for Mephibosheth, I want you to know he can do it for you. This is how the unfair favor of God works. And so David is just walking around the household in 2 Samuel 9. And he said, is there anyone a chance that I could still show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? Is there anyone from the house of Saul, anyone out there? You know, God can put you on someone's mind as you're sat in this room or on a campus right now or watching online. God can drop you into the heart of someone and that person is going to start looking for you, searching for you because they are sent of God to get you out of Lodabar. And some of you are sat here right now or watching online and God's dropping on your mind someone's name. Do not ignore it. Just like you heard last week, that might be the very person you're supposed to search and rescue because they've got stuck in low debar and God's dropping them on your mind for you to ring them, call them, text them and say, hey, did you know that I want to meet with you, see you because your purpose is not over? David said, is there anyone left in this servant says, well, actually, yeah, there's the son of Jonathan and he is lame in both feet. And so David said, well, where is he? He said, oh, he's living in a place. It's a great place, not called Lo Debar. And David said, send for him. Here's what you need to know. God will send for you. But that's where you have to respond. See, some of you, God is calling you out of Lodabar, but you have got so used to living in Lodabar, you think that pajamas are everyday wear. You used to be up and at them. You used to be excited about the future. You used to be getting up. And now because you can't do life like you normally do, something inside you has gone to sleep. And I'm here this morning to say, wake up. Spiritually, wake yourself up. Get to the prayer meeting at 6 a.m. Believe God for a change in your environment and circumstances. You gotta get up. Jesus will invite you like David was inviting Mephibosheth to leave Lodabar. But the invitation comes from God, but the response comes from you. Just like the guys in the boat, the disciples, Jesus walks by, says, follow me. What comes next is up to them. You can stay all your life in this boat, or you can believe me that there's something beyond this boat that actually is part of your future. Here's what Jesus didn't do. Okay, guys, I just want you to know I'm gathering this group together. And uh, here's the criteria. And here's the ones that have already been accepted into the program. You might wanna read their profile, see if you like the other disciples I've chosen. If you feel that you have similar hobbies, feel like you could get along, then maybe you could jump on board and follow me. It's like a small team. But you know, check it out, see how you feel. No! Some of you are waiting for the perfect small group. 
There is no such thing. And if there was, when you join it, it won't be perfect anymore, right? So you just have to sometimes go, I'm in. I don't even know what comes next. I don't know who's at the group. I don't know what they're gonna do, but I'm in. Why? Because I can't live in Lodabar anymore. I am taking my pajamas off. <laughs> Secondly, I wanna say this to you. Lodabar may be your location, but it is not your final destination. <laughs> Please cancel the Amazon order for furniture to be delivered to Lodabar. Stop furnishing Lodabar. You are not staying there. It is not your final destination. Stop inviting your friends to come and live in Lodabar with you. No, don't do it. So there's a verse in the Bible. I think we get it twisted sometimes. It's found in Psalm 23. You know it well. It talks about how it makes me lay down in green pastures. And same thing, it says that when we come to a valley, what do we do? We walk through the valley. God guides us, leads us through the valley, and He makes us lie down in green pastures. I think in some people's Bible reading, they got that mixed up. And they're like, I lie down in the valley, and I just run by the pastures. No. You're not supposed to lie down in the valley. You're supposed to walk through the valley and you lie down in the pasture. So guess what? If you're in a place called Lodabar where there's no pasture, that means no lying down. No lying down. No lying down your dream. No lying down your enthusiasm. No lying down your plans. No lying down your commitment to the house of God. No lying down. You have to keep moving when you're in low Dubai. You have to do something to tell your heart and tell your soul, I'm keeping moving, I'm keeping moving. Some of you have gone on pause in this season. Like spiritually, you're on pause, like, well, I'll move when I know what's next. (laughs) No, 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 we keep moving because this is a valley and we don't live in valleys. So we keep moving, we keep praying, we keep worshiping, we keep giving, we keep committing, we keep serving God. Why? Because we keep moving in the valley because God has green pastures at the other side. This is not your final destination. I don't know who needs to hear that today, but someone needs to be reminded this is not your final destination. Don't get so familiar, so comfortable. See, the thing about when you live in Lodabar, is everybody else that's in Lodabar has been through something like you. So all the conversations are at a Lodabar level. All the conversations are miserable. They are depressing. They are full of anxiety. They are full of fear. And that's why you can't afford to spend all your time in Lodabar because you need the conversation that's at the other side. You need to have a conversation that tells you, I know you lost your job, but you know what? That happened to me and God gave me a better one. You know what? I know this is freaking you out right now, but I've realized that God's in charge, so I'm keeping moving forward. Those are the conversations you need around you and they don't happen in Lodabar. Everybody dresses the same in Lodabar. They all walk around in their slippers and their PJs, shuffling around. Listen, I love a good pair of PJs. But I had to have a little talk to myself during this whole quarantine season we have been in. Like, Charlotte, these are not the only clothes in your wardrobe. There comes a moment when you have to spiritually say, I'm getting dressed. Putting on the clothes that God says He's picked out for me. And putting on the wardrobe and putting on the garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. I'm getting my worship on. I'm getting my prayer on because this is not where I am staying. This is not where I choose to make my final destination. So the invite comes. And Mephibosheth, even though he feels not dressed for the occasion to go to the palace, even though he feels like I don't have much to bring, he decides to go. And he meets David. And I want you to know this final point that plays out in this story. Number three, your infirmity isn't your identity, but it can be your authority. 
this young man crippled because of something that happened to him. Up until this point, nobody calls him by name. When David asks, is there anyone from Saul's line? The response comes, there is a lame guy. People referred to him by his disability. They referred to him by the injury that life had given him. It had become his identity. He was the lame, he was the cripple, he was the guy that couldn't walk very well. No one used his name. And that had so got on him that when he finds himself in front of David, he responds to David in a way that tells you his infirmity had become his identity. Because David begins to tell him, hey, I know you've been living in Lodabar, but things are about to change. Because God put you on my mind so that he could show you how he rewrites your story. And so David, when he sees Mephibosheth, he says, I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather. And you will always eat at the king's table. I mean, this is a good news day. This is a, whoa, what just happened? I just went from Lodabar to being told I have a seat at the king's table. I just went from everything was lost to everything will be restored. But watch his response. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? It's amazing how we can allow seasons of bitterness or seasons of betrayal, seasons of pain, seasons of hurt, seasons of loss, to become our identity, we're always known as the one that is offended or the one that lost or the one that was hurt or the one that failed morally. We're always known if we allow it, the world will keep us in the box attached to us. But your affirmity is not your identity. But God will flip the script and make it your authority. And that's exactly what happens in this story. Because up until this point, no one's used his name. But let me tell you something. When you're invited to sit at the king's table, everybody calls you by name. Nobody's saying, hey, lame guy, do you want a seat? They're bowing down and saying, Mephibosheth, where would you like to sit? Mephibosheth, can I bring you some food? Mephibosheth, is the temperature okay? Mephibosheth, what can I do to serve you? Everybody had to call him by name because he had a seat at the king's table. And can I tell you something about his name? Do you know what the name Mephibosheth means? Mephibosheth means the destroyer of shame. All of a sudden, the infirmity became his place of authority, that he sat at the king's table and every time they said his name, it was like destroying the shame that the world wanted to attach to him. It was destroying the shame of the accident that happened to him. It was destroying the shame that Lodabar had tried to put on him. Every time they said Mephibosheth, they were saying, destroy the shame, destroy the shame, destroy the shame. And I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what circumstance you would say, it's unfair. I know life is unfair, but the favor and the goodness and the kindness of God will find you. It is already on its way to you. God is putting you on people's minds. Some of you are in the building today, on a campus today, watching online today, and you know without the favor of God coming after you, you would not be living where you are right now. But God saw you in your low debar moment of no pasture, no word, no thing. And he said, don't let this become the place you unpack your life. For I'm sending my envoy to you. And when my envoy comes to you, it will invite you to shake that stuff off and begin to come to the king's table. Some of you say, I can't sit at the king's table. You don't know what I've done. I can't get in the presence of the king. I feel so ill-dressed. I don't even know if I would actually be able to be in a conversation other than a low debar type conversation. But Thibosheth had to fight all those things too. But I'm telling you, the minute he took his seat, he was reminded 
who he really was. The minute he sat back at that palace table where he'd grown up as a young man, the minute he stepped in the corridors where he would played as a child, the minute he got in the presence of the people that he did life around, he began to remember, I know this place. This is the place where I belong. Some of you just need to get back in the house, get back into community, get back into prayer, get back into serving. And you're gonna remind yourself all over again, I belong here. This is who I am. He wasn't the lame guy. He was Mephibosheth. He wasn't the mistake. He was chosen. And so wherever life has put you, whatever Lodabar looks like for you right now, there's an invitation to leave. All across the room in every campus. I'm just gonna ask you just to close your eyes. I'm gonna pray over you and then in a moment, I'm gonna invite those that really feel they need to leave Lodabar today, maybe make a decision to serve God today, to pray with me. God, I thank you for our house, for our church. I thank you for every incredible individual and family represented here at Highlands. Oh God, I thank you that you didn't call any one of us to live our life in Lodabar. So God, today I pray there will be a movement, a shift, those that have felt down would get up. Those that have felt ill-dressed would put on the clothing you picked out for them. Those who have felt cut off would get committed again. God, I thank you that you are the one that calls us by name, child of God, beloved, chosen, daughter, son of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Remind us of that today, God. Remind every single one that needs to know that your favour finds them, that it comes looking for them, that it seeks them and it calls them out. As our eyes are closed, if you're in the room today or you're watching online or another campus, you say, oh man, I, I need to know God. I don't really know Him in the way you're talking about. I didn't know that He invited me to the table. I, but I wanna know Him. I wanna know whose I am. I simply invite you to pray this prayer of salvation, of commitment. I'm gonna say the words out loud. You just say them in your heart right there where you are. Dear God, today I choose to follow you. I choose to leave my low to bar. God, forgive me of my sin. Today I receive your grace. Today I identify as a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen.